Before we get started, we're going to go ahead and have a word of prayer. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. Lord God, we thank you for this day this far. Lord God, we thank you because you woke us up this morning and gave us an opportunity, Lord God, to participate in this day. Lord God, to be living epistles for you. And Lord God, we pray right now that you, Lord God, endue me with your power, Lord God, to open up my mouth and say what thus saith the Lord. Lord God, allow everyone under the sound of my voice to have receptive hearts. Lord God, give them a, a ear to hear. Lord God, allow them to, to understand your, your word and then to apply it to their lives. Lord God, we pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen and amen. So this evening, we're going to talk about moving beyond. And I'm sure you're probably wondering, moving beyond what? But even as I was thinking about the, the song that I was, was listening to um, about the, the Holy Spirit, that, that right there makes me excited. And I can get caught up in, in just thanking God and, and praising him because I still say that no matter what material or temporal things that God blesses me with on this earth, my salvation is, is the greatest thing that he ever, ever allowed me to have. And so I could thank him all day. I could thank him all night just for that. But as much as I would like to do that, there's a work that must be done. And so at some point, you, I, we all have to move beyond certain things. And what I want to talk about tonight is, is more about moving past certain emotions. And so we'll go from one extreme to, to the other. So the first one is that, that excitement and the praise and, and the worship. And, and it's a good thing. Don't get me wrong. And, and we get caught up in the praise and, and, and the worship, but we don't go on to do the work of the Lord, the work that God has called for us to do. And then even the work that he has, has placed specifically on your life and on my life. And so that's kind of what I want to talk about tonight. We don't want to get stagnant in, in, in a good place or stagnant in a bad place. So we're going to go from one extreme to the other. So the, the first one is moving beyond the, the blessings where we just want to praise God all day long to the exclusion of all else. And we'll give you some, some Bible for that so you can better understand exactly what it is that I'm trying to explain to you because I don't want you to think that it, sometimes because we move, we're not saying that's Satan's fault because it's, it's not. We just get caught up in a point and then we kind of forget or get stuck in that that point and we can't move on. But we need to move on because like I said, there's work to be done in the kingdom of God. And so we have to be able to recognize that and then be able to walk in the power and authority that God has given us. So I'll start us off with, with a scripture, which is Ephesians 3 and 20. It says, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh within us. But sometimes, I think I might have talked about this before, we don't always activate the power that's within us. We kind of ignore it and tamp it down and, and push it down and, and go on and do something else. But, but we need to be about our Father's business. Amen. So there's nothing wrong, like I said, with being excited about our blessings, but we can't take that too far. So Many believers don't experience power because they never get beyond the point of blessings, of those temporal, those good things that only happen to us because of God. If God didn't do it, it never would have gotten done. And so I can give you some, some examples because all of these are, are some, my own personal examples be, because they, they happen to, to me and I thank God for it and I praise him for it in my private times, in my corporate times, but I know that there's still a work for me to do. So yeah, I, I can thank God and I do thank God because of, of his grace on 
done all my life, but I'm going to show you some tangible things. So I, I can remember in, in my 20s when I was sick unto death, when they didn't think I was going to make it at the hospital, and yet God delivered me. That's something that I'm mightily thankful for. I can remember uh, two near fatal car accidents again in my maybe in my late 20s, early 30s that God delivered me from, spared my life. And then I, I can remember someone telling me this I, I really thank God for. I can remember somebody telling me it was on my 45th birthday and, and they said they were shocked that I had lived to, to be 45 because of my lifestyle because of my lifestyle and yet me being knowing about god realizing that it was nothing but the grace of god that saw me through all of those years when i turned my back on god but he never gave up on me and if you don't think that's something to shout about and something to be happy about and something to praise god for i beg to differ with you because like i said i value my eternal salvation more than I value any temporal thing on this earth. And so just like I'm excited for myself and everything that God has done for me in my past, in my present, and what I know that he's going to do in my future, I'm just as excited for you. I know that God has done great things for you. I know he's going to do great things for you. Uh, he's a God. He's not a respecter of person. And I know that, that just like he did it for me, he will also do it for you. So every time God makes a way out of no way, we should be grateful and we should be joyous. The Bible tells us to, to praise him. And it's so funny because I'm telling you that we need to, to move beyond. And it's not saying because then we will be going against the Bible. I'm not saying don't do it. Don't get me wrong. There's just comes a time and a place where we have to move beyond. We can't let that be the only single thing that we do for God because he requires more. He wants more from us. So I tell you, that it's a command that, that we praise him. I don't want anybody to get me wrong. It's a command. The Bible tells us in Psalms 150 verses 1 through 3, it says, Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and the, the harp. In other words, with everything you got, give God praise. And I aim to do that, and I'm sure that, that you do too. And so, no doubt, many of us that were at church this morning had a wonderful time expressing our, our praise and our adoration towards God. And when the Holy Spirit begins to, to move upon us, we know how we feel. We felt great joy, don't we? Didn't we? We feel great joy when the Holy Spirit just descends and, and rests upon us. And, and we feel all that, that, that urge and that move to, to clap our hands and wave our hands and shout and do whatever else it is that we do to praise God. And so like I said, we, we express it in our, our singing and in our shouting and in our, our dancing. And sometimes we cry and sometimes we just wave our hands. We just lift our hands. But however we do it, we're giving God praise. And so we're blessed by God and we respond emotionally. We respond emotionally. And there's nothing wrong with that because the Bible, again, speaks about rejoicing. So as Apostle Paul, he admonishes us to rejoice in the Lord always always stay with me because i'm going somewhere with this because i'm telling you there's more than praising and shouting at the same time i'm telling you that it's a commandment that we praise god and the bible also tells us that we are to rejoice in god always and that is true that is true we just need to know how to to do it in a way that 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 allows us to carry on the work that god has assigned us to to do so like I said, the Bible is, is filled with, with lots of, of accounts of, of spiritual experiences. For example, the one that we can, can look to is, is King David when he danced before God. That's in 2 Samuel 6 and, and 16. And it says, and David danced before the Lord with all his might. 
and this was due to the ark being brought into the city and it goes on to say and as the ark of the lord came into the city of david michael who was saul's daughter looked through a window and saw king david leaping and dancing before the lord so we know that there's nothing wrong with it we read about it in the the bible that was an old testament account let me give you a new testament account about the man who was was halt or was was lame and and as peter and and john approached them and approached him and had an encounter with him we know that the man was was healed and that's acts 3 and 8 where it says that he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple walking and leaping and praising god amen he had received a blessing and so a blessing of deliverance he was now whole he he had he was lame something was wrong with his leg he couldn't walk right and now he had been made whole through the power of god as demonstrated through peter and john and he began to praise god so here's where we're going to make that distinction at god <laughs> allowed him that opportunity to praise him for what he had done and he did it and he continued to do it but at the same time he had a a work to do there was something that that he needed to to do because if you read that account peter and john were arrested for what they had did Ah, oh, but the man that had been healed kind of came to their rescue, so to speak, because he stood up when they were in the, the courtyard. He stood up and he testified on their behalf, even as he was leaping and dancing and praising the Lord for the miracle that had been bestowed on his life. So he just think if he had went home and, and just praised God in his home and never stepped out again. And so nobody could see what had happened to him. Nobody could see the demonstration of the power of God in his life. Let's think about a, another account. This is the one with the man that was demented, had had demons and demons with, with him. I think it said a legion of, of demons with, within him. And Jesus passing through saw him and healed him. And the man was, was so ecstatic that he had been healed that he wanted to stay with, with, with Jesus. And, and I really like this. Who, who could blame him? He had been tortured and tormented by those demons for, for years, put in, in precarious situations because of this legion of demons that possessed him. And then this man comes along and delivers him. Who wouldn't want to stay with that person? And he asked Jesus, can I stay with you? But Jesus said, no, because there's a work for you to do. There, there's a work for you to do. And so even though he praised God and wanted to stay with God, he had to go and do the work that was assigned to him. Just imagine if he had not did the work that God had assigned to him. With the woman up with the issue of blood, when she had been delivered, with the man that, that had the daughter that died, when, when she had died, if Jesus had not come along and, and revived her and everybody else in that city that, that had ailments or illness or whatever was wrong with them, had not that man did the work that Jesus sent him to do, which was to tell of the goodness of God and what had happened to him with those people, would have been the throng of people there that was there when he returned to the city. Because this one man, this one man didn't get stuck in a place, but he went ahead and did the work that was assigned to him. So that's what I'm trying to, to tell you. Just, just think about it. Even in our services, when the joy of the Lord falls on us and his spirit is high, much like it was today, and we begin to shout and we begin to dance before God, this is all wonderful and, and it's good, Ah, but we can't become complacent in this. Just as those two men that I just talked about did not come complacent in, in their, their praise to God, but they went on to do the thing that was assigned to them to do, we have to be the same way. We cannot become complacent. It's just so much more that God has for us 
to do, which is recorded in his word. And not only is it recorded in his word, when God speaks to you on a personal level and tells you of the things that he would have you to do. Amen. Would you rather just be complacent in, in your praise and, and going to church one time a week and giving God the praise? Or will you be obedient to his will and do what he would have you to do? Amen. So God wants us to move, wants his people to move beyond the point of the emotionalism of, of blessings into the realm of spiritual power. He wants us to move beyond our emotional experiences to demonstration of power through him. He doesn't want us to just be, be satisfied coming to, to church just to get our emotional fix, so to speak. He wants us to do more than that. And I'll emphasize it again and again and again. There's absolutely nothing wrong with praising God. But he's got a work for us to do. Amen. So we have to move beyond our emotional experiences to demonstration of power through him. We can't, we, we can't, we must not ever get to a point of complacency in God, nor should we be bound by fear, doubt, and intimidation. And that's the other um, end of the spectrum. You know, one side we're excited and, and giddy over here, and on the other side we're, we're fearful and, and bound by doubt and intimidation. We're not to do that either. The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy 1 and 7, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. Amen. So we can't get caught up in doubt and we can't get caught up in fear and we can't get caught up in, in um, intimidation. We can't be bound by fear, nor can we be comfortable in our fear to move beyond what is comfortable for us. That I tell you, that complacency is, is bad. It, we just cannot be complacent in any of those things. We have to be constantly moving forward in God. Amen. So we can't be bound by it. We have to move beyond that. And when we do become complacent, then we also, think about this, become stagnant. Meaning that, that we can't move. I call it being fat and full. Just, just satisfied right where we are without even realizing that we're stuck and we're not moving. Mm, that's not a good place to, to be in, in, in God. God is a progressive God. And so we should be progressive also. Amen. So we need to understand that complacency and satisfaction with an emotional experience is not the purpose of God's calling on our life. He didn't call us to be fat, full, and satisfied and just sit back and enjoy the services and enjoy the singing and enjoying the work and not saying that you can't, but I'll keep saying over and over and over, it's more to it than that. God has a work for us. Amen. He has a work for us to do and just sitting and not moving, we cannot get that work done. So if our excitement, if it comes from anticipation, from the anticipation of going to church for that emotional experience, or as I heard it called, once that emotional fix, that experience of, of singing and shouting and dancing before God, then like I said, we've missed the mark. We've missed the mark and we don't understand our calling from God because he has a work for us to do. Amen. Keep that in mind. He has a work for us to do. So let's think about King David, as I said before, loved to worship God. He loved to sing praises to God, but he also worked mightily for God. He was a worker. He continued to take dominion over the land that God had promised. He continued to take dominion over it. That meant he had to work. They were always at war. So just like God didn't make David king just so he could wear a crown, 
God does not save us just to sit in service after service after service, receiving his word, praising and worshiping him, or studying his, his word to the exclusion of all else. There's a work to do. Amen. So at some point, it becomes time to do the work that he has called us to do. Amen. It is time to move beyond hearing so that we can start doing. Amen. We can't just come to, to hear and, and, and participate. At some point, we'll participate in the singing, the, the shouting, the, the praising. At some point, we got to start working. It's got to start doing the work that God has called us to do. And that's Bible. The Bible says in James 1 and 22, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving our own selves. There's consequences to being hearers only and not being doers. We need to be hearers and doers of his word. So I'm going to tell you an account in the Old Testament which illustrates this truth, and it also illustrates the, the link between a promise and the possessing of, of a promise. The promise was given, uh, but it came with some work. And because you're not willing to do the work, then you miss out on the, the promise. And so that's just another way of me saying you have to be a doer. So we know about the, the children of, of, of Israel and how they were in bondage to, to Egypt and how God delivered them from, from Egypt. And they ended up in, in the wilderness Ah, I'll say they, they travel unnecessary years to get from Egypt, traveling through the desert to get to the land that God promised them. They travel some unnecessary years. And when I say unnecessary, it's because when they reached the edge or they were on the brink of coming to the, the promised land, Moses sent out 12 spies to check out the land. 10 other spies brought back a negative report. They said that there were giants, and you can read this is in Numbers uh, chapter 13. Um, it says that there were, were giants in the land, and there was no way that Israel could go to possess the land. So they brought back a, a negative report which that in itself, I don't understand. This is the land that God promised you and you come back and say, we can't possess it because you see something that you don't think your God is able to do or take care of for, for you. So anyway, the Bible says that, this is Numbers 13 and 32, and they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel saying, the land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. In other words, we're scared, we're fearful, we're, we're doubtful. But remember, he said 12. Two of the men, they came back with a positive report. That was Joshua and, and Caleb. They were the only two that came back with a positive report. And they urged the people to enter into the land and possess it just as God had promised. God made them a promise. And, and this is what they said. This is in Numbers 14 and 7. It says, and they spoke unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying the land which we pass through to search it, it is an exceeding good land. They saw the promise of God. They weren't concerned about it. However, Israel chose to listen to the negative report. And because of this, although it was only a number of days to journey from where they were camped to the promised land, it took Israel 40 years to make that journey. They were steeped in fear, too scared to move forward, negating the very power of God. Mm, so they became stagnant. 40 years wandering around in the, the desert. Thank you, Jesus. <coughs> Excuse me. 
So didn't even consider that they had been delivered out of the hands of the Egyptians, had been delivered from, from bondage. God had, had brought Israel to the point of another blessing. How easily they forgot the first blessing that had been bestowed upon them. And so they were at the edge of the promised land. Uh, and God's power was available to conquer the enemy. They just did not avail themselves of it. Too fearful. The very God that had did so many miraculous things in, in their life, they forgot about it at that moment because what they saw in front of them instead of believing the truth of God. Amen. So we don't want to get stuck like that. We don't want to not do what we're supposed to do because of, of fear. That's where our faith comes in. You have to believe that God will do every single thing that he said he would do. If he promised it to you, you have to believe that promise. And you have to move forward to that promise. You can't just sit and be complacent and be wishy-washy. At one point, they wished they were back in, in Egypt can't do that. God is always looking for us to move forward, not backwards, and certainly not just stand still. Hey, Amen. And so it was just so sad that Israel refused to move forward in God's power. Refused to move forward. They would rather stay where they were or worse yet, return to Egypt before they trusted God to deliver on his promise. They didn't have the mindset of, of Joshua and Caleb who believed in, in God. They said in Numbers 14 and chapter 14 and verse 8, if the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Amen. They believe the promises of, of God. The question is, do you believe? Do you trust and believe that you serve a God that is able to do the impossible? The first scripture I, I read out of Ephesians says that he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you can think or ask. So I have to believe that when he says it, it is going to come to pass. Amen. So Let's think about this. God made a promise to them and there was nothing wrong with the promise. The problem was Israel refused to possess it. They refused to do what it took to take hold of that promise. And so I'm telling you now that we must not stop when we get to a point of spiritual power being demonstrated in our lives or it's being introduced to the power of God working in our lives. We must press forward into the spiritual realm of power, despite what our natural eye sees, despite what our inner feelings or emotions may be, we must continue to step forward, to press forward. If we don't do this, then we will become, uh, just like they did, we'll continue to wander in a wilderness of dry, powerless existence. And that certainly is not what God wants for us. It's not what God wants for us. He wants us to live a blessed life. He wants us to live a life that's endued with power. He wants us to be strong soldiers in him. He wants us to be living epistles, just like those two men in the New Testament accounts, living epistles. People's lives were changed because of their testimony, because of the power that was, was worked through them through by God. They were living epistles. We need to be living epistles and not just stuck in our own emotions and in our own doubts and, and fears. But we need to move beyond that and get into the realm of power that God has available for us to use so that he can get the glory out of our lives. Uh, he wants the power within us, which is his power, to be seen by the world. 
He wants it to be seen. He wants a demonstration of his power, uh, not just for the sake of seeing it, so that others can see and believe that there is a living God, that there is hope beyond what people see, that there's a God that loves them. And just as he works miracles and works miraculous ways in your life and in my life, he can do the same in theirs. Amen. God wants us to multiply this thing. Amen. Multiply it. Be a living epistle for God. Amen. Don't get stuck where you are. Not in a, in, in a, a, a good emotion and not in fear, doubt, and intimidation. Don't get stuck in those, those emotions. Amen. So we must move beyond the point of blessing into the realm of power. We must become a demonstrator instead of a spectator. We have God within us. And so we need to demonstrate that. We need to show people. We need to let people know. We need to, as the Bible says, let our light shine. Let our light shine so that others can see, so that others can believe. Amen. Be a doer instead of a hearer. So when we do so, uh, we will experience the true un un uninterrupted flow of God's power. Amen. When we surrender our all to, to, to God and we move beyond our feelings, I go back again and I think about Jesus in that garden. You can't tell me he wasn't emotional. You can't tell me that he was dealing with all different types of emotions. And yet he moved beyond that. The moment he said, but nevertheless, not my will. Not what I'm feeling, because I tell you, if it was me, I'm feeling a little scary right now. I'm getting a little nervous right now. I know what's getting ready to happen. Actually, I'm feeling a little dreadful right now. Ah, but I'm going to push all of that aside. And God, if it's your will, then that's what I'm going to do. And that's the mindset that we should all have. Amen. That we want to move beyond whatever those feelings are that are holding us and making us be stagnant and not move forward in God. Amen. We want that uninter uninterrupted flow of God's power. Uh, when we get that, then we'll experience life after religion. What do you mean by that, Pastor? Life after religion. It means all oh, that we will no longer be just dancing, shouting, good time within the confines of the church wall. What we will become is living, walking, talking, demonstrating children of God. Amen. Amen. I know that's what I want to be. That's my goal is to be a child of God that everybody can see that this is who I am. Everybody can see a difference in me. They may not know right off the bat what they, that difference is, but they'll know that there's something different and they'll want it. Amen. They'll say, how can she have peace like that? How can she have joy like that? Things are going wrong and yet she still has a joy that I don't have. She has a peace that I don't have. What is that? Amen, amen. That's what we should all want. Amen. So let me tell you, you, you may think that you cannot experience this power. Some people, now this is where the enemy will come in and will try to jack your thoughts up and make you think that, that you're not good enough, make you think that you can't experience the power of, of God because you lack education or maybe you don't hold a ministerial uh, credential with any denomination, uh, but according to God's word, we know that he uses people regardless of their position, regardless of their social standing, regardless of their education, regardless of their financial status, and all other things that men count as qualifiers to say that you're able to do the important work of God. God doesn't hold that against you. If he wants to use you, he'll use you in spite of all of that. Amen. I it's only men that puts those qualifiers on us. 
are the qualifiers that God puts on us is totally different and has nothing to do with any of that. So none of these things need stand in the way of our receiving spiritual power. Ah, but just think you may not fall into any of those categories. You may be financially set and you may have a, a degree and you're high up in a social circle. You may have all that. Ah, but, but like I stated, ah, you may think that you're not good enough, that you're not worthy, that you're too weak, that you're too frail, you're too young, or you're too old, your skin color is not the right color, and, and so you have all those doubts and, and those fears that flowing through you, and that's not the case either. God can use you whether you're young or whether you're old. He calls you whether you're young or whether you're old. He calls you regardless of your skin color. Amen. Amen. So let me tell you, here I go again, is I, I, I love taking my strolls through the Bible because you can understand and you can get so much knowledge, you know, by reading and studying and understanding the, the Bible. And so I'm going through the Bible and consider this because I'm not just telling you what I think. I'm telling you what I have read in the Bible. And so when I think about all the men and women in the Bible that God used, some were poor and some were uneducated. Some were Jews and some were, were Gentiles. It didn't matter. If God called you, that's all that, that matters. And so we should be willing, just based on the strength of that, to move forward into whatever it is that God would have us to be. So, but I'm going to tell you, I'm going to go through the Bible and I'm going to name off some people because you may find yourself in that situation. And then you tell yourself if that person could do it and they had that problem or they had that situation and God used them, then I know that God can use me too. Amen. So let's start off with, with Adam. Ah, uh, not Adam. I'm sorry, with Abraham. Abraham lied about Sarah, his wife, because of fear. There's the fear factor again. He had some fear. And so he lied about Sarah being his wife and said Sarah was his sister instead. And yet, even though he did that, he was used of God to found the nation of Israel. Amen. He's the father of, of the nation of Israel, despite the fact that that he lied. And then we have Moses. And the Bible tells us that Moses says, I, I'm not a good speaker. I, I, I stutter, you know, when I talk. And then not only that, he was a murderer. He killed somebody when he was in Egypt. That's why he, he left. One of the reasons why he left. And yet God used him to lead an entire nation, the children of Israel, to the promised land. Amen. Fit in wherever you wherever you can and know that God can use you. And so then we have Peter, and Peter sank while walking on water, lost his focus, and he fainted. I mean, and, and I'm sorry, and, and got scared, almost drowned. Ah, oh, but he always said the wrong thing at, at the wrong time. And in the end, at that crucial moment, he denied even knowing Jesus. And yet, yet, this ordinary fisherman stood and gave a powerful witness on the day of Pentecost that resulted in the salvation of nearly 3,000 souls. Amen. Amen. That was Peter. And then we have young Gideon. Young man, I told you it's not just for the old, young and old alike. We have young Gideon, a young man that was hiding in fear of the Midianites and the, the Amalekites that had just was terrorizing the children of, of, of Israel and waiting. Uh, they were hiding in fear because he was waiting for a good time to thresh their harvest. Their own harvest, but yet he had to hide in, in fear and wait until a good time to be able to, to do that. But this man was called of God to deliver an entire nation from those oppressive Midianites and Amalekites. This fearful young man, but God used him. Amen. And then, of course, we know we have King David who committed adultery, took another man's wife, and then had that man murdered. Yet, 
He was the greatest king of Israel and called a man after God's own heart. Sin. But yet God called him. God called him. Then you have Peter and, and, and John together, and both of them were fishermen and neither had any money or education to speak of, but the healing power of God flowed through them to stir entire cities. Amen. The, the healing powers that, that they possessed and the word that they was able to, to give, the prayers that they prayed for, for a different one. Just two ordinary fishermen with no money and no education to speak of. And then we have Apostle Paul, who was establishing churches almost everywhere he went and converting souls everywhere he went. And it was said of him, it's recorded in the, in the Bible, that his letters were powerful, but his bodily presence was weak and he had poor speech. Couldn't talk that good. And yet we know how mightily God used Apostle Paul. Amen. God used Apostle Paul and, and his partner Silas so much that it's recorded in Acts 17 and 6 that these are the men that have turned the world upside down through their preaching of the gospel, through their prayers, through their healing, through their converting of, of souls, through the establishment of, of God's people everywhere they went. They are the two that are said to have turned the world upside down in, in their time. Oh, just, and, and Apostle Paul, mm, <laughs> he was one that before he came to Christ, torturing Christians wherever he went. And yet God called him in a miraculous way. God wanted to use him for his glory. Amen. What can God do with our lives? Amen. So then we have Jacob. Jacob was a deceiver. Jacob was a liar. And Jacob was a schemer. Oh, but when God touched him and got a hold of him, he became a prince with power, with God, and with men. Amen. That's the power of God. What God can do in your life. Just don't become stagnant. Allow God to use you. Amen. So I, I let, read you off a list of, of men. Oh, but there's women because I don't want women. There's no sexism in God. He doesn't just use men. He uses whomever he chooses. And that includes women. So I look at Deborah, who is one of the judges over Israel. And then we have Mary, the mother of Jesus. Oh, and then we have Elizabeth, who was the mother of the forerunner of, of Jesus. We have Abigail, oh my God, who was able to save her family, her, her household. God used her in a mighty way. And we know if we continue to read that account, she became one of David's wives, amen, but not stagnant in their emotions, in their fear, ah, oh, not sitting back fat and full and happy off of the blessings that God, through his loving grace and mercy, bestowed upon you, but I'm about my father's business, I thank him, but I'm about my father's business, amen, doing whatever it is that God would have me and you to do, amen, so I could go on and on and on, but I'll invite you to open up your Bible and read it of, of all these different men and, and women that carried on the work of God. Amen. So if men and women, think about this, men and women such as those yet liars, cheaters, schemers, uh, adulterers, all, everybody was in, in the mix. Murderers, that's a murderers. All types of people in the mix that God called and changed their lives and they did the work of God. Amen. So if men and women such as these can be entrusted with spiritual power by and through God, we can also. Amen. Despite our human weaknesses, and our failures. God can pick you up, can turn you around, and make you a whole new creature. Amen. Through Christ Jesus. And so just like them, God calls ordinary men and ordinary women just like you and I. 
just like them and makes us extraordinary, just like he made them extraordinary. He doesn't see us the way we see ourselves. He doesn't even see us the way men sees us. He doesn't see us like others see us. He, he doesn't see us that way. He sees us as we are to be in him. That's how he sees us. That's how he can take you. I'm so glad that God doesn't judge the way the, the, the world will, will judge you and will condemn you for life. But he gives us the opportunity to take our lives and turn it around and give it to him and let him use us. Amen. I'm so glad he doesn't throw us away. I'm so glad for that because I would have been gone a long time ago. I would have been gone a long time ago. I would have been condemned to hell a long time ago. Had not it been for God's grace, his mercy, his loving kindness, uh, gently drawing me in and getting me back to a place in him so that I could do the work of my father. Amen. That's what it's all about. Doing the work of our heavenly father. So God sees us as we can become when we are endued uh, with his power, with that spiritual power. God uses ordinary people, what the Bible calls earthen vessels. That's what he uses. Apostle Paul explains it very well. He states in 2 Corinthians 4 and 7, he says, but we have this treasure the treasure is Christ Jesus in us. That's our, the earthen vessels. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. That's why he endues us with power. Ah, so we know some of the things that, that, that we do is only because of the power of God flowing through us. That's how we're able to, to do those things. And the reason... He put this treasure in us. Apostle Paul goes on to explain is that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Not of us. It's of God. We can do the work of God because we have his power residing within us. Amen. Now that right there is something that ought to make you want to shout. Amen. That we have the power of God residing within us. Amen. So I want to tell you, let's not be like the 10 spies. Those 10 spies um, in the, with the Israelites that were bound by, by fear and went back and gave a, a negative report. It wasn't a, a lie. There was giants there. And, and the land was overflowing with, 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 with an abundance or overabundance of, 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 um, of food, of, of like grapes, I believe is what they were talking about, how big the, the grapes was. That was true, but they were looking at it through their spiritual, uh, I mean, through their natural eyes and not looking at it through their spiritual eyes, not realizing that this promise that God had made them ah, was a big promise and he delivered on it. I'm giving you a land that flows with milk and honey. And why would I put it there for you to just look at and not be able to possess it? If I bought you to it, don't you think I'm going to be able to take you into it? But that fear gripped them and they couldn't allow their faith to believe that God would see them through the very same God. I have to keep coming back to that because we need to think about that. We can't give up wherever we are in our walk in life. We, we can't give up if we only look back and realize where God brought us from. We can, if we only look back and see the, the blessings that he's bestowed upon us, if we only look back and see where, what he's delivered us from, some of us was bound up in all types of sin, but yet you're delivered today. On your own, would you have been delivered? Could you have delivered yourself? I can speak for myself and I can say no. The times that, that something within me would say no, Candy. 
and I would override it because I did not have the power of God residing within me. So even though there was a part of me that said no, even though there was a part of me that did not want to partake of that particular thing, all because I didn't have the power of God, I was weak and I would say yes anyway. Couldn't stop it. Had to, couldn't help this, can't help this, whatever you want to call it. Oh, but with the power of God residing within me, gave me the strength, gave me the, the, the faith to be able to say no and not worry about the consequences of my no. Because I know that i got a God that will never leave me, that will never forsake me. And if he brought me out of it, I know that he's going to see me through it. Amen. Amen. Let's think about that. We don't want to be like the 10 spies. We want to be like the two that saw through their spiritual eyes and realized that God had indeed brought them to the promised land. And all that was left to do was to cross over in it, knowing that they had Jesus on their side. Amen. Amen. That was a, a powerful lesson. So like I said, either way you go, don't get stuck. Well, there, there was... um. I can't remember this when this was, but I was sitting on my couch one day counting my blessings, counting my blessings. And I think that's when God struck me with, with, with this. And, and, and I know God knows my heart and he knows that I'm grateful because he bought me out of a horrible pit, out of a horrible situation. And, and I'm not ashamed to say that I'm blessed. Amen. God has, has blessed me and, and I thank God for it, but I can't get stuck there. Now that God has, has blessed me, I need to continue on doing the work of God, doing whatever it is that he would have me to do. I can't get stuck in complacency because God brought me out and now I'm happy and I'm satisfied and I don't have to do anything else, but thank God. No. Mm -mm. I thank you, God, even as I'm doing the work that you called me to do. Amen. So let's keep that in, in mind. I, I pray that, that something was, was said, amen, that will help you on your journey. It doesn't matter where you are. You could be, be um, in your journey. You could just well into your journey. You could be just starting off or you may not have even started yet, but just know that God is calling you and he can take you and he can fix you. He can clean you up. Ah, oh, he can, can make you into the person that he has called you to be. Amen. But believe that no matter where you are at this point in your life, don't stop. Don't stop. Keep moving forward. Don't give up. Keep moving forward. Get to know God in a better way. Come to know him in a better way so that his power may be revealed through you. Amen. Let others see the miraculous work that God has done in your life. Go out and share the good news of, of Jesus. Share the, the, the good news. Mm. Be in the very image of, of, of Jesus. Show love. Show compassion. That's what Jesus did. That's what drew me. That realization that despite my filthy self, Despite my filthy self, God still loved me. God still loves me. He loved me then. He loves me now. And he loves you and you and you. Amen. So we can't give up. We can't turn back. We can't look back. We have to constantly move and work for God, move forward. I love it. As our bishop said this morning, we have so much work to do and so little time. We don't have time to stop. We don't have time to pause. We have to constantly and steadily be about our father's business. So prayerfully, something was said on tonight that will bless you, something that was, was said tonight that will enlighten you, something was said tonight that will encourage you, something that was said tonight that will empower you, amen, to move beyond whatever emotion is keeping you stagnant, oh, that you'll continue to move forward and do the work of God. 
Amen. So God bless you. I pray that you all have a blessed night tonight, that you'll continue on in Jesus' name. I love you all and good night.